Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm um, talking to you. I'm from St. George's University of London, which, um, for those that don't know, is a specialist medical and healthcare um, institution. That's all we teach. So we, we are fully embedded in that. I should stress that I'm a technologist and educationist. I'm not a medical or healthcare professional to my shame. So actually, subject matter things with this, I know nothing about. And I couldn't be less informed. But um, I'm going to talk to you really about um, the challenges that we have in um, delivering delivering online and distance e-learning across the range of learners and particularly the work that we are now doing to broaden that definition of who our learners are. Um, start off just by um, acknowledging I have no conflict of interest to disclose concerning this presentation and perhaps even more importantly I want to mention that the work I'm presenting here is collaborative it's not my work it's that of all of the members for the Centre for Technology and Education in which I work as well as collaboration with other centres. Um, I'm the head of the e-learning team at St George's which is part of the Centre for Technology and Education and we're responsible for part of all of this um, this work that's being done. So really I just wanted to start off by sort of setting the scene from the point of view of medical education. Um, it's got a long history of innovation in medicine and healthcare. Um, it's embraced technology at various stages. I mean, we'll all be, I suspect, familiar with the different types of simulations and high fidelity simulations that there are around using mannequins. There's um, embraced technology using virtual, virtual reality in some instances and things like that. Medicine and healthcare education has long used videos to demonstrate skills and um, procedures that can take place and there's also been a lot of work about um, for, particularly from the simulation space about taking um, analytics um, that come from simulation um, there's data standards that go on there's an organization called Medbiquitous that's based at the American Association of Medical Colleges um, that looks at it, um, applying something called experience API to really capture what goes on as part of these simulation activities and use them as part of the very important debriefing and things that goes on. So medical edu and healthcare education has long been innovative, but not just in technology. It's also it's also responded a lot to pedagogical innovation and been and has been driven a lot. So um, many of you might be familiar with problem based learning. Um, I'm not going to get into the minefield about where that originated, but I think general consensus is that's been used in medical schools for a long, long time. Um, in some instances, since the 60s, it's been um, very much focused on learning through scenarios, learning to, uh, through problems and applying knowledge using, um, using different approaches to innovation. It's got a sister um, process, case-based learning. Again, it's about applying knowledge, looking at skills, soft skills like clinical reasoning. Um, even with assessment, OSCEs um, that started um, being, were innovative when they started about looking at the ways that we assess and really trying to assess um, our students very deeply. Um, the image that you can see here is a recent one um, that took place of a, um, a team-based learning session. So team-based learning has been used across lots of different disciplines, but it's been also embraced by medicine and healthcare. Um, this was actually from a relatively new profession, um, physician associate. Um, a session that they were using that was combining technologies of all sorts. So it was using online technologies, working with teams, peers in a room, obviously pre-COVID, this photo, um, and um, but also utilising all the technologies available, flip charts, paper, iPads, laptops, a really sort of innovative and active approach to learning. So medicine and healthcare has always been um, very receptive to these. I want to talk about something that's very specific for us at St. George's that's driven a lot of our work with technology um, and e-learning um, called virtual patients. And um, this is a short sentence that describes what a virtu defines the virtual patient, an interactive computer simulation of real life clinical scenarios for the purpose of medical training, education or assessment. Um, the picture that you see is a quite an old web based one. It's embellished with videos, but it's the text is the key thing. Um, that we have used a lot, and I'll talk a little bit about the ways we've used it. But this has underpinned an awful lot of technology um, pro progress that we've um, explored. Um, 
we've used it through projects as part of um, more serious games, the idea of a virtual patient and an online scenario that trains um, students in the application of skills. Use it on mobile platforms. We've also used them in conjunction with high fidelity simulation. So part of either, either capturing simulations and using them in part of the virtual patients or the other way, um, using virtual patients as um, pre-work for high fidelity simulations where it can tackle some of the things that it can do better or part of the debriefing exercise. Within our problem-based learning curriculum, this is a key thing for us. I will talk about this more, but this is an example of a problem-based learning group at St. George's. And also within lectures, we've used these virtual patients um, as, as a key thing that's driven our approach to what's predominantly thus far been blended learning, um, combining technology with working face-to-face. -face. It's also allowed us to look at um, very specific um, approaches to our education. There's a quote from um, 2009 from the um, editor of the Medical Education Journal. Educators should be working to induce error in learners, leading them to short-term pain for long-term gain. This led us to think about this particular image that was taken of a student doing one of our virtual patients long time ago now, this is about 2008. They were running a, um, a virtual patient about a pediatric case where they were looking at um, treating a baby. And their decisions that they made, we tried and tried and still killed the baby. I will never ever forget that. And that that experience led to us looking about virtual patients for things like specific areas such as medical errors and patient safety. Um, really interesting area to explore what these relatively low fidelity tools could do for our students. But as I say, so far for us, that has mostly been about delivering blended learning. That's been working with our students to um, to, give, to use technology to enhance their learning in that way. Um, we've done lots of things with this. The uh, problem-based learning, the, it was absolutely crucial for us. We looked at taking these virtual patients and enhancing our face-to-face our -face problem based learning, um, which looked a little bit like the diagram that you see on the right originally. This was the case that they worked through. With online virtual patients, we could turn it into this. We could introduce decision-making, giving them a chance to make changes, um, discuss, uh, influence the narrative and how it goes through and deliver feedback in much more interesting ways, depending upon what the decisions they made. These were the basis of projects we did to transform the curriculum with other collaborators, other, um, uh, other um, European and um, global institutions to look at introducing problem-based learning using these tools for them. And also um, using, within St. George's, we've used high fidelity simulation. No, this is not specifically our work, but we have the St. George's Gap Center, um, the paramedic and radiography um, subjects have very um, sophisticated simulation suites that they use um, to deliver technology enhanced learning to some extent. But it's all been blended, it's all been face to face. And I guess this is where we come to COVID times, which is, you know, it's a, it's originally I wrote it's evolved our online provision, but it's not, it's revolutionized it, it's really taken it on. But more than that, you know, we were delivering this blended learning, and like everybody else, we've had to move online, but it's also forced our minds to something we we're already thinking about, about who are our learners. So traditionally, we always, there is a tendency for us to think of them as our students on our talk programs that are living in and around London. But I think what we as an institution really need to do is broaden our definition of who our learners are. Because actually, if you look at the things that we offer, then that's not just our learners, that's not just our priority. They're also professionals. Um, the importance of CPD in the medical and healthcare professions is absolutely paramount. And um, through the Royal Colleges, they have accreditation for learning. So lifelong learning takes place. And these are not, this is not learning that takes place on taught programs like we're used to. And it's different disciplines. Um, we have, there's a, learners are global these days, particularly with the provision of online and distance e-learning. We, um, learners can be from anywhere. They're not always gonna be located in London. They're gonna be located at different levels of learning, training. And that's something that we have to evolve our educational provision 
to, um, to address and to really see that we can meet the needs of those learners. Similarly, our traditional learners also have new expectations. They've, they've been at home for um, a significant amount of time in the last two years, and they want to be able to learn more flexibly. They want to be able to learn at distance, potentially um, learn, learn different times, different locations. So these are things we need to address, and we really have to rethink about what, who our learners are at this stage. And I think we had been moving towards this. This is something that actually um, something like our MOOC provision over a number of years has been um, telling us that with sort of surreptitiously. So we've been partners on Future Learn since about 2015, 2016. And if you look at the MOOC courses that we've created, we can see that um, a lot of them have actually been for CPD rather than for our traditional students. We've had perhaps one course really that was only focused and only relevant to our traditional students. A lot of them, far more of them, have been somewhere in the middle. They've been, um, they've been there, um, we've used them for our students, but they've also been targeted for those professionals and having professional learners already qualified, learning with our trainees, our students, um, is a valuable thing for the peer learning sort of experience that takes place on these platforms. I mean, similarly to sort of in include that, we use our MOOCs in our talk programs as well quite extensively. So um, we have our, some of our MOOCs on the left and this, these are the programs that they um, are being used in. So we, we direct our students to our MOOCs, um, our genomic technologies MOOCs um, across three courses there on the right. We have courses here that on the left that are all used as part of our MBBS medicine program. Other courses that um, align more directly with single programs. So we, we have a lot of cross pollination of our learners there. They're not different segregated groups. Our professional learners are learning with our students. And that's, um, that is a tension that we also have to address when we're designing the material. We also, when we think about it, have been delivering a number of professional education courses directly. And these haven't been really integrated in the mainstream of our institution yet. They've been happening on the side without perhaps them being a priority or being aware of. So we deliver a range of professional education courses that um, go to school leavers. You know, we've got a widening participation that reaches a whole host of different groups. Um, we have students and trainees, so we run a summer school that will, for students um, in other countries, other institutions, um, top up skills, things like that. And lots of courses for professional learners across different specialties, different professions. Um, we're co-located with a hospital, so many of those are delivered with um, clinical academics, clinical um, um, physicians and that deliver that. And these are many different types. They will, they will be short courses. They can be run over days, weeks. Um, they were mostly before the pandemic, they were offline, they were face-to-face, -face, but increasingly we're running a lot of them online. Even now we've been back to face-to-face -face for some time. And um, there's still, there's more, we're seeing more demand for this as a consequence of what we've had the last few years. They, we have conferences, workshops, single day events, and they run, for academic credit, some of them in the professional education. And that's been an, an interesting challenge to see providing academic credit for something that doesn't sit within a taught program. A lot of courses, do, people don't necessarily need academic credit and they might be looking more for continuing professional development, accreditation to use for their Royal College and their requirements to keep up their training as part of their practice. So this is where we find ourselves, really. We're actually starting to deliver a lot of these things to different groups, um, partly on, in a sort of online and distance form, but we're still sort of thinking about our students as being our students. So, and I think this is where we start to come across some of the challenges that we face. And this is where I want to talk really about the challenges and opportunities that we as a healthcare institution are looking, um, looking to for the future. So, Medicine and healthcare curricula, they're very highly regulated, they're heavily assessed, and a lot of the teaching on placements will take place within the NHS trusts. And given that set of circumstances, it's hard to affect changes on some of those taught programs. You know, there's, there's a lot of the change control has to be very rigorous. 
Um, so delivering those changes can be hard and that's going to be a challenge for us in the future. Um, similarly, the courses that rely on placements, um, the students need to be in clinical settings. They need to be working with patient facing skills. They need to be working with procedures, motor skills. And that's a hard thing to think about how we can deliver in a sort of online and distance e-learning way. You know, these are courses that sometimes they need to be hands on. They need to be face to face. Um, so working out where the lines are for us and what we can deliver online is going to be a, is going to be a challenge. Similarly, some of the solutions that we have had like physical simulations and mannequins are also not deliverable at distance. So these are things that we have to think about as well. And one, uh, another seemingly small but quite big issue for us, and this has been something that's cropped up in, deliver in trying to meet some of these ideas as professionals as our learners, is that the courses that don't carry credit, we don't have access to our traditional standard platforms or teaching solutions. Um, if they are not registered as our students, they cannot get access to our VLE they cannot get access, they don't have a computing account. So we find ourselves slightly hamstrung in what we can deliver. And this is why we've been looking at um, what we can do there. And it brings us really to a fork in the road. And um, we, have, we have an opportunity to broaden our definition of who our learners are. We have an opportunity to um, work towards serving more of, um, more of those professional learners. Um, as well as our students, our trainees at different levels, but we have to think a little bit differently and we have to consciously take that path towards it. There's a will to do so, I think it would be fair to say. Um, I've On the screen at the moment, you'll see a few selected um, sections from our strategy um, that was run ran from 2017 to 2022. So this needs refreshing now, but this has been in place since 2017. And amongst these very carefully selected items, there are some key things that I think support what I'm talking about and what I'm what I'm um, offering that we need to do. I mean, the third one, of course, is pretty clear: develop lifelong learners, diversifying and adapting our educational provision in response to changing learning needs. This is what we're seeing. We're seeing a more diverse learner audience. We're seeing changing learner needs and we need to listen to this element of our strategy and meet that. But we also have possibilities like attracting prospective students nationally and internationally. Online and distance e-learning can allow us to do that potentially if we can find the ways to target it and deliver the, le deliver the learning outcomes that we can um, within the medicine and healthcare field. You know, Always collaborating with students is essential. And I think to understand our learners, to make this learning that we provide learner centric, we need to listen to our students and work with them to do that. And hopefully that can help us to broaden their horizons beyond the curriculum as well, expose them to um, through online platforms to other learning, other, other um, experiences. Similarly, working with having our trainee students working with professional learners, um, if they have the opportunity to work together, to learn together, that exposes both groups to a different level of, different, level, different levels of experience. The students can learn from the professionals what's happening in practice. And the professionals can hopefully keep in touch with what they need to do to work with trainees, because that's a key part of working as a healthcare professional is, is to help deliver some of that training that takes place in NHS trusts. Another aspect that fits in very closely with this need to meet the um, to meet the professional learners was the Top All Review 2019 that um, was um, commissioned and for and by the NHS. Um, it was run, and I've just pulled out a sim simple quote from that. But to engage and support the workforce in a rapidly changing and highly technological workplace, NHS organisations need to develop a learning environment in which the workforce can be encouraged to learn continuously. Now that learning environment, we need to be, as a medical and healthcare institution, we need to be part of that learning environment that's serving the workforce, the medicine and healthcare workforce within this country and beyond. So this is something that we read and we really need to work to meet. 
So that really brings me on to the last aspect of this, which is what are we doing about this? We've identified there are challenges. There are some opportunities, a lot of op opportunities. What are we doing? And so this is something that the Centre for Technology and Education at St George's has been running across our institution since um, June 2021. Um, the online and distance course implementation project, which we've shortened um, ODSI for short. Um, we've been looking at how we can meet some of these opportunities, um, what challenges that this presents and how we can address them. So this, the aim of the projects has been to develop a clear framework for the successful rollout of online courses, expanding our portfolio of online courses where existing courses can or need to transition to being online to meet the, the, white, the sort of more flexible needs. And what's been really important for this project is to involve all the different areas of the organisation that we can, because each of these have an impact on how we can deliver this and need to affect change before we can meet this goal. Um, student records and systems, admissions and enrolment, um, the educational development and the teachers generally, the pedagogy that lies behind it. Professional education, the resourcing needed, the changing in resources, and in, really importantly, the last, the last three are crucial, quality and regulations. A lot of our systems are currently set up to validate courses, to meet the regulatory requirements for face-to-face. -face. What do we need to do differently in order to be able to, um, to assure the quality and to accredit online and distance courses? Student services, really critical. We, if we're gonna broaden our definition of learners, we need to take student services with us. They're set up to support our traditional learners, our um, trainees that are on site, our trainees that are um, in London. If they need to support global learners, professional learners that are not on site, that are at distance, we need to understand what they have to do and support that change to make it this work as a whole. And information services and information governance, there's obviously infrastructure that needs to be in place to support that. How can we get the platforms that we need to the students that we have? This is something that the project um, came up with as a sort of basic level of what we were looking at. We looked at mapping the courses that, for instance, were looking to change to online learning and seeing how they fit. And I sort of want to focus, we put them on this grid of really four sectors. There were a lot of courses that came in the top left-hand corner of the image that you'll see. And actually, really, this is just an existing blended delivery. They're rather, they're not looking to scale up their numbers and they're still looking to have quite a high level of synchrony in the teaching, you know, um, a lecturer talking to students, interacting with students, whether online or whether face-to-face. -face. It's really looking at just a, an evolution of our existing model. Um, a number of courses um, were in the top right-hand corner, which was they saying, we want to scale. We, we think this, uh, this course is really interesting globally. It's really interesting to different audiences, but perhaps their thinking of the teaching hadn't evolved in along those lines. They were thinking, well, we can deliver teaching online via Microsoft Teams and Zoom. There was a high level of synchrony there. And what this project identified is there's a big risk involved. You know, how do we deal with that level of synchroni synchronicity, um, that level of, you know, time, deal with time zones, deal with student support with that. That's, and that's something so that we've identified that as high risk and it's something we will go into only tentative, tentatively. Of most interest is the bottom right hand corner where you're talking about large scale, but you can teach through low levels of synchrony. Um, and this is more akin to your MOOCs, your online courses as, as we know them, where you can actually unlock the flexibility of course delivery for a wider audience. And the challenge is really to find areas in medicine and healthcare that can meet that, that, that can be delivered through that area. So I want to close really, because I'm, um, I think I'm nearly at time. Um, the recommendations, the Odyssey project has come, it's just closed now um, in the last couple of weeks. And so we've identified these different models and we need to select the most appropriate to support the learner needs, the different sorts of learners on each programme. You know, we're not gonna have a one size fits all solution that um, is best practice, is good practice for everybody. 
we know through this project we've identified a whole host of changes and modifications that are needed for systems and processes we know that to deliver this effectively and meet the needs of this wider definition of learners our professional learners as well as our students we need to consider the effect on student records admissions course teams and how they um, will engage with students and therefore we need different platforms we need different resources to provide rich content and particularly something that we've already had in the last couple of years because of changing legislation, a strong focus on digital accessibility. If we're going to deliver this effectively, digital accessibility has to be absolutely central to everything we do. Not an afterthought, not something that's tacked on. It's got to be built into the design of these courses. And we need to provide training for staff at all levels to reflect the different needs and the new business processes that are required. So we've got to bring that workforce with us. So finally, next steps, we're going to work to implement these Odyssey project recommendations. All these recommendations are going to go through the institutional process of approval. We're looking to widen our portfolio with, on, with online courses. We're looking to broaden our definition of learners. And we're looking to implement new guidelines for our teachers to help train them, help bring them in. And this is going to mean, mean in evolving our current online learning framework, which was introduced in response to COVID as an emergency, into a more thought through more um, deeper blended learning framework that will cover the range of modalities that we hope to deliver in future. So thank you very much. That's, um, that's the story through what we're doing and really um, any questions that you might have now from, from my perspective. <laughs>